A great upheaval had just taken place, altering the foundations of civilization in Greece and setting it on a new path. But for now, the once populous regions, with their citadels at the center, lay in ruins, and an eerie silence over the countryside replaced the everyday sounds of a society at its peak. Had the heroes of the Trojan War returned to find their homelands in utter ruin, or had they experienced the destruction and fled with others in search of new lands to settle, possibly being some of the first Greek colonists in Anatolia? Back in Greece, survivors of the disasters that had struck had now to turn to the business of survival, as the systems of the past civilizations were no longer in place to support them. Some would travel to neighboring regions in search of shelter and food, most likely encountering others hostile to newcomers, maybe planting the seed of xenophobia that would come to characterize the later Greeks' attitudes towards foreigners. Others may have found refuge with families and people where ties of friendship had existed for generations, also cementing in place another important notion to the later Greeks, Xenia, the guest host relationship. The Greeks that had stayed would form into small clusters of communities, either in the ruins of the great structures of old, or begin new settlements in areas rich in natural resources, while others would in small groups move throughout the region seasonally. Perhaps in some of these communities, newcomers from afar speaking a slightly different tongue had merged into them, as they had also fled from lands further afield. As life continued on its path, these communities were further established, and generations would start to pass with the living memory of the great palaces and disasters fading away. Tales of the golden times would be passed down in stories to the new generations, as well as tales of disaster and upheaval, immortalizing great heroes and families. Though to some ordinary people, life would seem to go on as usual, in small pockets of Greece, only hearing stories from travelers of great misfortunes. These pockets would seem to have escaped the worst of the Bronze Age collapse, with the only signs that a disturbance had taken place being the disruption in the old trade networks and the appearance of some refugees. Their course in history, though, had also changed since they existed in a world where the collapse had affected most around them. A complete reboot of civilization had not taken place, but more a quick restart after a computer crash. Some of the information had been lost, but much remained. It just had to be reinterpreted in the new context of society now existed in. While this process was taking place, it would seem to modern observers of history, thousands of years later, that someone had suddenly turned out the lights. Hello, I'm Mark Selig, and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 6, An Age of Darkness. Last time we dealt with the collapse of Mycenaean Greece, as well as the wider Mediterranean, which also drew to a close the Bronze Age. This time we are going to look at what was happening in Greece due to this collapse. This period that results from the end of the Bronze Age is referred to by most historians as the Dark Age, and generally runs from around 1150 BC until around between 800 and 750 BC. So why is it called a Dark Age? As we have seen from the last couple of episodes, archaeologists have uncovered a range of evidence such as palaces, tombs filled with golden grave goods, and Linear B tablets. But once the Mycenaeans descended into this period due to a whole range of explanations that cannot be properly explained in any coherent narrative, the types of artifacts that had been common in Mycenaean civilization cannot be seen in the archaeological record anymore, or nowhere near to the scale as before. Although we had a tough time trying to piece together Mycenaean civilization and are still unclear on how some of the evidence should be interpreted, we have even less of an idea or any clear history of the Dark Ages due to this lack of evidence. So these two elements, the lack of information from the period, as well as the apparent regression of culture, has given rise to this period as being a Dark Age. Although we are dealing with a Dark Age, it hasn't stopped archaeologists and historians from trying to piece together the evidence found over time. We must also keep in mind that the term Dark Age conjures up negative assumptions of the period, and from what we can see, much of Greece had gone into a regressive state. Though evidence has shown some areas thrive and it would be the beginning of some very important innovations moving into the archaic period in these areas. Greece would recover from this Dark Age after some 400 years, slightly behind the Near East. A new metal would come to replace the bronze that had defined a period, while a new form of writing would also emerge that would not fall silent again. We will also look at the criticism put forward by some historians about whether we should be thinking as this period as a Dark Age. But first we need to see what the Dark Age meant for Greece, and how had the Mycenaean collapse transformed the economy and society of Greece. When trying to get any sort of understanding of the Dark Ages in Greece, historians are left with very little evidence to work with compared to other time periods. 
In the archaeological record, two areas can be consistently pointed to at providing some level of understanding, though it still doesn't give any coherent narrative of the period. These two areas are pottery and the settlements themselves that were occupied, or in some cases, reoccupied. The onset of the Dark Ages is considered to have begun somewhere around 1150 BC, and its early period can be considered to last until around 1050 BC. This time frame is purely based on the fact that archaeological evidence provides a consistency when coming to look at the pottery and settlements. As we have said in one of the first episodes, names given to time periods are almost always given in hindsight as a convenient way to describe history. In this early period, the appearance of a new type of pottery was discovered, which became to be known as sub mycenaean came to replace the pottery of the Late Bronze Age, and even though it tried to replicate its style, it was of a much poorer quality. The patterns on the pottery itself were also of an amateurish nature, with free hand drawn lines and circles decorating just one part of it. As we saw from the last episode, a great deal of the towns and palaces that the Mycenaeans lived in were destroyed or abandoned, with some showing signs of reoccupation shortly afterwards. These towns that were reoccupied, or the ones that had been decimated, continued to operate but with a much smaller population and had rebuilt much simpler structures. What has been seen from this period has led many historians to see the early Dark Age period as a time of turmoil, where societies that had previously been under such highly regulated systems were now forced to cope with a new reality that was completely different to how their societies had operated for hundreds of years previously. As generations passed by, one could expect that this new world would now become normal, as the memories of the old disappeared from the living and were now passed down through shared stories. Much of this early period would have seen people learning how to organise themselves and their societies. This then brings us to the period from around 1050 to 900, where the archaeological record indicates some sort of progress. We now start to see the emergence of a pottery style known as proto-geometry, where the potter still uses straight lines and abstract shapes, but a greater attempt can be seen in making the vessel itself even all around and also trying to provide some symmetry to the artwork. What can also be seen with the increase of this type of pottery is a rise in the population and area that the settlements occupied. Perhaps this could be showing that the towns had become more organised and were attracting people from the countryside, or that conditions had improved so birth rates had increased in the general population, or both. This trend then seems to continue into the 9th century BC, where archaeologists can now identify another class of pottery, known as geometric. This time the vessels themselves start to alter and a range of new styles start to develop. The artwork on the vessel occupies much more of the surface area than previously and also shows an even greater level of care. Not only are abstracted shapes still decorating the vessels, but now depictions of animals and people are appearing as subjects. We also start to see other artistic items such as gold and ivory carvings making an appearance while also seeing yet more of an increase in population throughout Greece. This is probably a good time to discuss the importance of pottery in the archaeological record and its use in dating periods in ancient Greek history. We had spoken about radiocarbon dating in a previous episode, and as valuable and important as it is, there is an anomaly known as the Hallstatt Plateau. This is where radiocarbon dates that show around 2450 BC calibrate to somewhere between 800 and 400 BC, so relying on this method alone can become problematic. A tried and tested method for dating ancient Greek sites, and which has formed a basic foundation to work from, has been pottery style. If we think of modern times, a particular style becomes popular for a generation, or less in more modern times, before a new style takes its place. These could be styles in architecture, decor, fashion, or in common use items. This was also present in ancient times, though styles probably took longer to evolve due to slower rates of communication, trade, and items were probably produced on a much smaller scale than today. When we look for styles and their change, pottery has become the most consistently reliable source to look for this, and there are three main reasons for this. First, clay that has been kiln-fired is almost indestructible, meaning it doesn't decay or corrode. Secondly, general-use pottery was very common and inexpensive, so there was an abundance within Greece, and it would be thrown out freely, while items made of precious and general metals would largely be melted down to be reused. Lastly, the many options for variation existed in pottery as opposed to other art forms. To make stylistic comparisons, such variations could be in the shape of the vessel, the choice of the decorative design, and also the placement of the design. As we have seen already, the archaeologists had given each stylistic class a name, and these could also be further broken down to early, middle, and late. 
Later on, we also get classes known as Proto-Attic and Proto-Corinthian, named after the regions that these styles developed in. And we also get red figure and black figure, due to the colour of the figures that decorated the vessels. A great deal of the pottery evidence that has been uncovered comes from sites that have been continually occupied or had short periods of depopulation. What happens at these sites is that layers develop covering the older sites as sites are destroyed or abandoned and rebuilt upon. Each layer would become a period of habitation which is also referred to as a stratum, and generally speaking the deeper the layer the older it is. As different style pottery is uncovered it can be cross-referenced with the stratum level it was located in. Submycenaean pottery would be expected to be found in a lower stratum than proto-geometric pottery. This then gives a loose interpretation in relation to dating and archaeologists then turn to fixed points, which then helps ground the chronology with a bit more precision. Fixed points are when something can be confirmed to taking place through a record, such as a year given when a city was destroyed. The destruction layer can then be pinpointed, which then allows for more certainty of dating items found in those layers, as well as layers directly preceding and preceding it. These fixed dates can be found all through Near Eastern sites, as many inscriptions have been found that record these events. They can also derive from ancient historians relating known foundation dates of cities. Some of these fixed dates have been disputed, but on the whole, when used with other methods, a more precise date can be arrived at. Hopefully this gives a brief understanding of why pottery is so important to archaeologists when working on sites and trying to interpret them. So, back to the Dark Ages, or where there seems to be some light at the end of the tunnel. As time progressed, the archaeological evidence gradually begins to show an increase in the quality of the pottery found. Also running in conjunction with this, there appears to be an increase in the size of settlements and their populations. As we move towards the end of the Dark Age, this pattern continued, with further evidence pointing to greater wealth being generated, more organised social structures, and trade with the Near East re-establishing itself on a larger scale. During much of the Dark Age, people were poor, and the graves that had been uncovered for most of the period reflect this, with just ordinary clay pots as grave goods found with the bodies. Towards the end of the Dark Age, though, wealthy graves were found, with more precious items in them spread out all over Greece, albeit in small numbers. Many have seen this to indicate that a social hierarchy was once again starting to develop in settlements now that some parts of the population were able to generate more wealth. The bearing of valuable goods with a family member was the typical way of showing the status a person held in the society they lived. These settlements with the hierarchical structures developing in them seemed to show a new way people were organising society after the collapse of the Bronze Age kingdoms. In these new systems, it would appear that we are seeing the beginning of what would become the polis, or the city-state, that classical Greece is so famous for, and we will be talking about the polis much more in future episodes. The conditions of the Dark Ages across much of Greece seem to have encouraged a new power structure to develop in many of the regions. Instead of the kings of the past, a system of aristocracy develops in its stead. The term aristocracy basically means power of the well-born, or as we recognise it, ruled by the nobility. This may have been due to the settlements as they recovered and grew, were made up of family groups. Once more groups became part of the settlement, a hierarchical structure developed, based on the family and extended family groups perhaps giving us an origin of this concept. It would appear that humans find a way to become tribal in whatever context they are placed in. This system, as we will see over the coming episodes, would come to dominate much of the next 500 years in many parts, with small reforms slowly eroding away at the system. Although international trade may well have continued through most of the Dark Ages, it appears it would have been on a much smaller scale than what took place in the Bronze Age. However, towards the end of the Dark Age, there appears a much greater level of evidence the international trade was on the rise, with such items made out of ivory appearing in graves, which would have been sourced from Egypt. These increased contacts with the international community would have also facilitated in the spread of new ideas from the Near East, who emerged from the Dark Ages some 150 years earlier. In these new ideas, there are two technologies that were being developed and eventually helped Greece emerge from the Dark Age. These were the re-emergence of writing, though in a different form from that of Linear B, and a new metal known as iron which also saw this period in the Near East and Greece, known as the Iron Age. During the Dark Ages, this new metal started to replace the bronze, which had defined some 2,000 years of history in Greece. This new metal was much cheaper and easier to produce due to the ore being much more readily available, which may explain its rapid spread throughout the Greek and Near Eastern worlds. In a world where communities had become smaller, trade was at much more reduced levels and wealth had disappeared, 
Bronze was nowhere near as viable as previously. Iron ore could be mined locally and smelted, so the regions within Greece were not entirely at the mercy of the international trade routes as before. The introduction of iron into Greece seems to have taken place towards the end of the Mycenaean period, and from trade route connections that they had with Cyprus, Anatolia, and the Near East. Much higher temperatures were needed to heat iron ore, which was done in clay furnaces where temperatures could reach 1600 to 1700 degrees Celsius. Iron then started replacing most weapons and tools as the centuries passed, though bronze was still used for shields and armour. These new tools and weapons had advantages over the old bronze ones, as the iron kept a sharper edge for longer and was much more harder and also being much cheaper to produce. With the widespread use of iron in tools for agricultural uses, a link seems plausible when seeing a rise in population towards the end of the Dark Ages. The sharper and much more durable tools were able to increase efficiency in production, which in conjunction with other improvements, allowed more food to be grown, which could support a larger population. With the population increase, more labour was available for work in the fields, so more food was produced, which encouraged faster reproduction from a better fed population, which provided more people to produce more food. As this cycle repeated over generations, the populations in the Dark Age settlements would have increased greatly. With the descent into the Dark Ages, the Linear B texts of the Mycenaeans also faded into history. The Linear B system was cumbersome and would have been difficult to learn, which is why we probably only see official documents in the archaeological record. It had some 89 signs that represented syllables and another 60 ideograms, and of the tablets found, only a small number of handwriting styles can be identified. Most of the population would have been preliterate, with only a few professional scribes at each palace centre that would have kept and read official records. So with such a cumbersome and specialised system of writing, it isn't surprising that once the collapse of the Mycenaean world took place, the script disappeared. As the Greeks emerged from the Dark Ages, they did so with help from a new script, far different to what had been used before. It is unknown exactly when this new form of writing first appeared, though the first examples in the archaeological record appear around 800 to 750 BC. The consensus is that the Greeks adopted the Phoenician script, which was adapted to arrive at their own script. It is thought that the adaptions took place in a single location, and possibly by a single creator, before it spread into the Greek world. The many local Greek scripts that would emerge developed their own characteristics, but all would share a common link with the Phoenician script, suggesting they all derive from the initial adapted script. Where this new script would have been created is not known, but a few locations seem likely candidates, such as Crete and Cyprus, as these areas are where Greeks and Phoenicians would have been in constant contact and would have allowed for easy dissemination to the rest of the Greek world. The oldest known examples of the script are found on Euboea, providing another suggestion that possibly a Euboean was the creator and they learnt the original script from a trading site on the Anatolian coast, such as Almina, where large amounts of Euboean pottery have been uncovered. Another possible location that has been suggested is in Italy, where Eubeans and Phoenicians live side by side at a trading post called Pithecus. But with current evidence, we can't know for sure how, where, and who played the defining part in the birth of the Greek script. These are just the best proposals that scholars have come up with based off the current evidence. The letters of this new script that the Greeks used to bring some more light to history would also become the basis of the English alphabet. Greeks could now record their tales and epic poetry which would have been told and retold through generations with its oral tradition. They used a convention known as examiner verse, which allowed a pattern to be followed when telling a tale. This allowed the poem or tale to be more memorable, so easily passed on. Just think how easy it is to pick up and remember your favourite song lyrics. Now armed with this script, the Greeks were able to record and convey the same patterns into their oral tradition, into written form. As light was cast onto the period, with the recording of poems and future generations of writers, no factual information of the Mycenaean period was passed on like what we see with writers recording the Classical period. Had too many generations passed on with a mostly illiterate society for the populations to remember, for the invention of written history was still another four to five hundred years off. We don't get any factual accounts of the government, religion, or domestic and foreign interactions from the Mycenaean period in the emergence of this new literary tradition. What we do get, though, are the poems and tales that have been originally passed down orally before they were finally written down by later poets. These poems, instead of providing actual accounts, seem to show memories that have been passed down over many generations portraying the social structures and ethics of the generations of the oral storytellers themselves.
So far this episode, much of the picture that we get of Greece is one of regression and poverty for hundreds of years. But there also appears to be a few select sites that seem to have recovered much quicker from the general collapse in Greece. These sites were nowhere near the same scale and wealth as the Bronze Age palaces, but show an exception to the rule of what was taking place in most of Greece. One of these sites, Lefkandi, is located on the island of Euboea, which is separated from the Greek mainland by a narrow strait. The site of Lefkandi was first settled on a continual basis in the early Bronze Age, and then the site seems to be rebuilt around 1200 BC, with some suggesting the rebuilding was done by refugees fleeing other areas of Greece. Here was discovered the earliest known colonnade structure that could be considered monumental, which dates to around 1000 BC. The main building was 45 metres long and 10 metres wide. The structure was built on stone foundations and constructed with mud brick walls and gabled thatch roof. It was supported by internal columns and outside a wooden colonnade. Under the centre of the building, two shafts were discovered where the skeletons of four horses were found in one and the remains of a male and female in the other, along with the spearhead, sword, razor and other iron, bronze and gold items. Also at the site were discovered important luxury items from Cyprus, Egypt and the Near East. The site of Lacande was in contrast with much of the rest of Greece in this time, enjoying prosperous times with its abundance of imported and precious goods, though this wouldn't last and as the rest of Greece was emerging from the Dark Ages, the region here was going into decline. In modern times, as more and more discoveries have been made that correspond to this period, some historians have questioned if the title of Dark Ages is still relevant for this period. For the Bronze Age, although it is still hard to piece together a clear picture, it has been possible to use archaeological finds along with Linear B tablets to help give some context. With the Dark Ages, all signs of a script disappear, and in the past, physical evidence was very sparse. So gaining a picture of the period was extremely difficult. In recent decades, much more archaeological evidence of sites fitting into this period has come to light, which has posed the question of if the term Dark Age is any longer relevant. This argument may hold some water if we are just thinking of the Dark Ages in terms of our past ignorance of the period, but the evidence that continues to be uncovered is still pointing to a period of instability, isolation and general regression. As we have pointed out, there were some exceptions to this rule, which have also been used to question the title of Dark Age, such as Lefkandi. These exceptions only make up a small portion of evidence of the Dark Age settlements, with the majority suggesting that Greece had slipped into a period of darkness in terms of cultural and civilised development. It would seem the title of Dark Ages still holds for this period, and until more sites like that of Lefkandi, or discoveries calling into question the regressive nature of the period can be found, this part of the Greek timeline still seems to hold true. The great civilizations of the Minoans and then the Mycenaeans collapsed, and the whole Greek world was thrown into chaos. The old systems no longer supported the populations that had dramatically decreased through warfare, famine, and fleeing their homelands. The once great civilizations disappeared from living memory, only surviving in fantastical tales passed down from generation to generation. This new age the Greeks were thrust into had a dark shadow cast upon it, with the disappearance of regulated society, wealth and the thinned out scattering of populations, shielding it from future ages. The later Greeks would not remember much of this dark age, but thanks to oral traditions and the invention of the Greek alphabet, tales of a great time gone past before would stir in their imaginations. In our own times, we can now start to see into this fog cast over the dark age, thanks to modern archaeology. We can see a great reduction and dispersal of people trying to reorganise themselves and as time would go by, this reorganisation would take place. Settlements would increase in size and productivity would gradually increase, with the development of a new hierarchical structure to oversee it. As these structures improved, so would the wealth generated by the trade that again started to take place on a larger scale. With the increase and strengthening of trade networks, domestically and internationally, the adoption of new technologies would filter through and take hold. Iron would greatly improve the productivity which in turn stimulated population growth further. The reinvention of writing would bring light back to this period and would help the spread of ideas. This script would not be forgotten and the Greek alphabet would go on to influence our own English one. The conditions of the Dark Ages and how the populations adapted to the new world around them, coupled with the new advances in technologies, would be the foundation of what would develop over the next few centuries. 
Merging out of this dark and hazy period would be the rebirth of Greece and its establishment of ideas that still survive today. Thank you for your continued support. To receive updates and to be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at castingthroughancientgreece.com. Also, you can follow the series on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 7, The Archaic Age, A Rebirth. <laughs>